wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. This is your host, Fuad Kassab, and with me is my co-host, Joe Witten. Hello, Joe Joe. Hello. I thought you said we were being really serious. This is serious. Oh, okay. Let's yeah. talk about the podcast, though. What have we got on? Yes. Okay. Well, we're talking about building biology and does your house kill you? No. Is your house killing you? What's that TV show? Uh, it's a TV show on SBS, apparently. Game of um, about uh, is, I don't know. No, no, not uh, that one. <laughs> something about is your house killing you or something like that. My sister was telling me about it. Mm. I've never seen it. But it's that sort of idea of what's what's in your environment in your home that you need to um, dun, dun, dun. what's going to be in your house <laughs> mold toxic gases lead paint um humidity dust mites dust CMRs, cmfs <laughs> uh, all that kind but of don't stuff worry. it's not a depressing episode because there's lots of things that you can do very practical so, yes yeah, very practical um i love it's great to uh, uh, really look at this. I'm actually going to get um, one of the ladies who works with Nicole Bilsma. I think that's how you say Nicole's last name. It's B-I-L-J-S-M-A. So I'm assuming We're hoping we've got like it right. a, a silent J. Um, but if it's not, it might be Bilsma. So Nicole, <laughs> Nicole Bilsma, though, is going to be uh, our guest for today and uh, one of the girls who trained under Nicole is going to come and uh, look at my house and it's we might do good. another episode, episode yeah. of what we found in the house. I'm hoping that we'll get um, her up to visit us too in far north Queensland and she can come and check mine. Yeah, so Nicole was really like a really great speaker on so the Notice how like, just on point she was and she could recall yeah. all this information. And really yeah, she's like a cyclopedia. Yeah, I was like, wow, this, this is incredible. I know, she's That's obviously like, spoken yeah. a lot about it. Yeah, and she lives in a toxin-free home, so her brain is working really well. So that's it. I think that's what it is. So um, Nicole is the founder of the Australian College of Env- Environmental Studies, and um, it's if you go to their website www.aces or aces.edu.au, you can learn more about it. They will put a few links around uh, at the end of the show notes, so you can know a bit more about Nicole. But it. It's a really, really good resource. The website is great. Nicole has a personal website that has uh, some really great information as well. Um, enjoy this episode a lot, and it's going to be very, very useful. And it's one of those things where you can just get someone to, to have a look at your house. You know, you pay. It's not, um, uh, in my view, it's not expensive uh, to have a, a house looked at. I think it costs something around 500 bucks to get your whole house inspected, and, you know, really thoroughly, depending on the size of your house. And then from there, you'll get a full report about all the areas that are problematic. And it's better to know. It's better to have these diagnostics with you than not. And, um, and, and there's also, you know, there was a lot of things that she said that anybody could put into practice, even, you know, if you can't afford to get the house done straight away, there's lots of ideas, ideas of things that you can begin working on. Yeah. Just really practical stuff. Really great. So um, shall we move on to the show, Joe? Yeah, sure. Uh-huh. Bye, guys. Uh, enjoy the show. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to the show. Thank you so much. And Joe, uh, stay on the line so I can annoy you offline. <laughs> sure. Uh, Bye, guys. Hi, everyone. It's Joe here, and I've got Fuad and Nicole with me, and we can't wait to get into this really interesting topic. How are you, Nicole? I'm um, well, thank you. It's great. So you're living in, you live in Melbourne, is that right? I do, yes, in the beautiful town of Warrandyte, which is quite the closest state national park to the city of Melbourne. Oh, now that sounds good. I've never been there. Have you, Ford? No, I've never been, no. no. Next trip. <laughs> we love Melbourne, so I'm definitely going to get back there at some point. Yeah, it's beautiful. So are you going to kick us off, Ford? Oh, sure. <laughs> Okay, Nicole, so uh, 
you're from the Australian College of Environmental Studies, and uh, there's a um, big term about building biology. Now, um, this was something that people didn't really know about and starting to emerge in people's minds. And we would love to cover this topic with you and talk about uh, all the areas that this science touches and what it looks like uh, when people are looking at this for their homes. Can you just give us a, an overview of what you do and the areas that uh, the science touches? Absolutely. Uh, building biology is an industry that looks at, that investigates and quantifies the health hazards in the built environment. So we look at everything from electromagnetic fields, indoor air quality, chemicals in building materials, furnishings, and of course food packaging, um, clothing, as well as things like electromagnetic fields, as I mentioned, and mould. Mould is a big part of what we do. So mm. any way in which the home could affect people's health that's what we look at. So it's a nationally accredited advanced diploma of building biology. It's two years full-time, four years part-time, and it really looks at um, how we go in and do an inspection and quantify using lots of different um, tools we have in our kit, from thermal cameras to moisture meters to um, VOC pumps, etc., to be able to see is there a connection between the patient's ill health and their home, or if they're looking at preparing to get pregnant, are there chemicals or cleaning regimes we can teach them about pest management to reduce their exposure to toxic chemicals? Um, how long have you been doing this work, Nicole? Since 2000. Um, okay. It started when I got sick moving into our home and had 10 miscarriages. And oh, then wow. I sleeping near the meter panel. And um, a lot of my patients at the time, I was working as a naturopath and acupuncturist, and many of my patients with chronic fatigue symptoms would say, what do you think of the visible mould in my home? By the third consultation, I'll go, I have no idea. <laughs> I've never learned anything about that. And realise that the double degree that I did in naturopathy and acupuncture completely did not prepare me for people with asthma or allergies because they're breathing in the problem and most of it was in the home, um, or chronic illnesses, ironically, because diet is important, but it's not the be all and end all. And in fact, the environment in our home is the elephant in the room, as the scientific literature is showing us every day. Great. So this is um, really good now that this kind of uh, work is starting to come to people's minds and they're looking at it because, yes, you're absolutely right. We do prioritize diet because it's the kind of thing that we kind of can control as we go shopping and we bring things into the house and put them in our mouths. Um, but these environmental things can often be hidden. And um, this is really interesting to hear you talk about um, the miscarriages that you had and things like mold and um, the meter. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that and what you found out for yourself on your journey before we talk about how building biology um, assessments take place? Sure. So my husband and I moved into our first home that we bought in Warrandyte and um, um, within days we weren't sleeping very well, but it didn't connect that the house could be contributing um, in the first year, I fell pregnant and then miscarried at around 11 or 12 weeks and subsequently went on to have 10 miscarriages in seven years. And um, we realised, as I started to look back, that our health declined when we moved into the home and we were sleeping right on the, on the wall where the meter panel was. I also, if I started to look into indoor air quality and realised the traffic-related air pollution... Um, would triple in our bedroom because we were living next to a T intersection where the traffic would bank up and carbon monoxide levels would tri triple in our bedroom and take two to three hours to dissipate and then the peak hour traffic at night would, would start. Um, also, when I was learned to douse and pick up geopathic stress that was under our bedroom. So there were so many things going on in the bedroom and when I talked to the neighbour about it, she sort of indicated that no one had that had successfully had children in this home despite the fact it was 70 years old. So I said to my husband, let's move to the back bedroom. And um, I fell pregnant naturally. We didn't qualify for IVF because I got pregnant naturally. And But we'd seen, had seen so many specialists, recurrent miscarriage clinic at the Royal Women's and IVF specialists and haematologists and immunologists and no one could help us or, or give us any explanation as to why I was miscarrying. And I said to my husband, I think the house is uh, the problem. Let's go in the back bedroom. We did. Fell pregnant with the twins and the rest is history. Had three children. Oh, even twins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two at once. Yeah. So how how did you figure out that the meter was the problem? Had you read something about it or 
it just made sense to me. I thought, well, mm. here's a meter panel. So I just looked in the scientific literature and PubMed and went, oh, God, there's some research to show that magnetic right. from um, uh, meter panels could cause miscarriage. That means only a handful of studies then. That has grown quite a lot since then. Um, but the mag AC magnetic fields from meter panels can be a problem. And I mean, the first um, literature on magnetic fields came from the study in 1979 by Wertheimer and Lieper, who were investigating the relationship between trying to figure out why children had childhood leukemia. When they went to visit their homes, they found many of them live near high voltage transmission lines. So they got an engineer to develop a meter, which we now refer to as a Gauss meter. And they found if children were sleeping or living um, within a certain distance, which varied depending on the levels, but basically if they were exposed to four milligauss or more in the first 15 years of their life by living near these high voltage transmission lines, their incidence of childhood leukemia doubled. Now, if you mm -hmm. sleep in a meter panel, it could be more than a thousand milligauss that it's emitting. Mm -hmm. um, and that drops off about after two meters a distance from the meter panel. And of course, now we have smart meters, which are even worse because they emit radio frequencies in addition to the magnetic field. So why on earth the building code allows people to put a meter panel on a wall of a bedroom is just, I don't understand. In light yeah, of the crazy. I have that actually on my bedroom wall. We moved to a house in the Blue Mountains last year and um, I bought a device off eBay. I'm not sure even if it's the, you know, the best kind of device, probably yours is uh, much more professional than mine, but it, uh, reads EMF signals and deep thread if it's sort of like high. And, um, so I I went into my bedroom and the meter was on you know, on the side where usually like the the bed would I put the head of the bed there and have my bed next like my head facing or next to the meter on the other side and uh, it was just re registering such high voltage or whatever. What's the what's the measurement that is actually? If uh, you're measuring magnetic fields, it's milligauss or teslas. Mm, okay, right. right. And it was just, um, yeah, showing that it was really high there. And um, I, um, I asked around if we could move the meter and they said the cost would be almost prohibitive or like really expensive. Um, yeah. So I switched the bed around and put, put my head on the other side of the bedroom where it was sort of registering that it wasn't registering the Teslas or um, the EMFs. And we've been sleeping like, um, like that ever since I still worry that it's causing me problems because I remember in the previous house I was having such terrible sleep and that's when I bought that device to see what's going on because the meter was on the other side and right, right next to my head it was just such high uh, mm. uh, and I started uh, sleeping you know with my feet towards it and I started sleeping way way better which was incredibly strange and uh, worrying at the same time um, what, what kind of uh, advice do you have around that? Like, is that is that something just for my personal sake? Is is it better to get the meter moved or like having like the bed sort of on the other side of the room? Okay. Well, we know um, the magnetic field affects melatonin, so that's why your sleep is disturbed, and that's the first sign of electromagnetic sensitivity is sleep disturbance. Um, others get different symptoms, which we can go into. But, yeah, sleep disturbances by sleeping near a high magnetic field, even a digital alarm clock that's within 30 centimetres of your head is a problem or a mobile phone under your pillow, um, that's a disaster. So mm. there's, there's a, a, we know it affects melatonin, we know it affects sleep cycles, but clinicians and doctors and naturopaths don't know this information and that's the problem because they're mm. not advising or even asking the question, which is why as part of my PhD I'm developing a healthy home survey for anyone to use to rate the health of their home and see if there are correlations to their ill health. In terms of suggestions, relocating a meter panel will cost anywhere between seven and $10,000. So wow. it's incredible to do it because you need just not just an electrician but also the power company to get involved and ideally at the design stage that's when really you should enlist a building biologist to assist you in designing all of this so this never happens you know mm. um, you can use shielding paints etc on the wall if you can't move your bed um, which you should do if you're in a room that you can't get out of that room and make it into a spare room or a junk room that would be better if you've got a meter panel there an inverter would be the same an inverter a solar inverter if you've got photovoltaics is, is also equally a problem as a meter panel really 
and so you don't want that anywhere near on the walls of your, any of your bedrooms. So you convert that room into a junk room or a spare bedroom. You know, if people are sleeping there for a few nights because they're staying over, fair enough, but it's not long-term. It's long-term exposure that's the problem. If you can't move rooms, then put your bed head on the opposite wall, furthest away from the meter panel because distance is the key to reducing exposure. And if you can't, for whatever reason, move your bed and it has to stay against the meter panel, then... Like what you suggested, Bowd, was to relocate. So your bed, your head is actually pointing into the room and put your feet towards the wall because your feet don't have a vital organ like a brain or a heart. You want to keep them away from the meter panel. Mm. You can use shielding, but that will only reduce and not get rid of the radio frequency or wireless component. It will do nothing for the magnetic field, which is still a problem, which is why really ideally you just need to get that bed away from that wall. Okay, right. and uh, you say it depends on the region with the safe distances, is that correct? Yeah, so the only way you can reduce exposure to electromagnetic fields is called the inverse square law, which is as you double the distance away from the source, you reduce your exposure by 75%. So okay. the, the greater the distance, the better. Yeah. We generally find within two metres away that the, the levels drop off to background levels. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty much that, that far from it now in terms of where my feet touch. So I feel that might be a safe distance in terms of um, my bed, which, and I'm sleeping, okay? So maybe that's an indicator that my melatonin isn't being affected, correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. And um, maybe talk a little bit about the smart meters. You mentioned that they, they were much worse. Why is that? Because they have not just current going through them and current creates the magnetic field. They also have a wireless component so that the power company can um, read your meter remotely without having to go there. So it's a wireless component. The problem is it has a switch mode power supply which creates a huge amount of dirty power or dirty electricity and we're finding some people are very sensitive to this dirty electricity which is really high frequency spikes going from about 50 hertz to the radio frequency band of the electromagnetic spectrum. In a nutshell, it's... um, not a good thing. No. I'm wondering with, with that, um, like I don't know what, um, I, I think in Victoria they're doing uh, smart meters everywhere. Uh, is this something that uh, energy companies are moving to change in all homes or is it just installing in new houses or what are the options available for people? Can they opt in or out of this? Because our house doesn't have it, but we're in front of Queensland. Yeah, so I'm wondering whether this, <laughs> there's some kind of rollout taking place across the country or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, from my belief, my understanding is that Victoria was the first where it was um, forcibly rolled out. I don't have a smart meter because they could never access it through my locked garage and my dog. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, great. So I, I think about 10% of the Victorian community don't have smart meters for that reason hmm. and they've sort of left it at that. Uh, I, the fact that it's been compulsory is really against human rights. It is compulsory, it is. is it? Yeah. That's, that, that's what I'm asking. Is it compu- It is compulsory, right? Yes, and I believe yeah. we're trying to do that in New South Wales, roll it out now. Is that for new buildings or existing buildings? Existing buildings. Right. Yeah. Um, right. If you have a solar panel or want to put solar panels on, in your house, then you will automatically upgrade it to a smart meter. Oh. oh, well, then we must have one now because we just got solar panels. <laughs> Yeah, so they will put a smart meter in and change your old meter. Okay. Well, ours is on the very end of the house against the garage, so I'm not too worried. That should be okay, right? Yeah, it should be. Uh, Okay, so, so, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, Really interested in hearing you talk about environmental mold because you you mentioned that earlier. Can you riff off on that, please? Yes. Well, it counts for about 50% of the work we do is going into water damaged buildings and uh, helping clients who, who may be affected by mould. Now, in the past, in literature, scientific literature, we know that water damaged buildings can contribute to asthma and allergies like hay fever and sinus and eczema. A lot of people, a lot of clinicians don't realise mm. that skin conditions can be very strongly correlated with um, mouldy or water damaged buildings. Um, However, we've started to get an understanding that there are certain people, 24% of the population can't create antibodies to mould. And every time they go into these buildings, it sets up inflammation in their bodies that doesn't switch off. 
Mm. So when they go into it, it's set, the body goes, ah, yep, these are microbial antigens or foreign particles on microbes like bacteria and fungi that are in your body. This shouldn't be here, so let's set up inflammation. And that's normal for the first time you're exposed to those microbes. The body in a healthy person will then go, okay, let's send you to a different part of the immune system to create the soldiers or antibodies. So next time you walk into your home, it's going to identify those microbial antigens and get rid of them before it even mounts any inflammatory response. Um, 24% of the population can't do this. So every time they walk into their home, the body has like Alzheimer's. It says, oh, I don't remember you. So let's set up inflammation. And this inflammation in their brain results in brain fog, like poor concentration of memory, anomia, missing words. They be, some of them become dyslexic. It affects their ability to deal with pain. They end up with pain throughout the body that's not explained by anything. They end up with sleep disturbances. They end up with weird infections in their upper respiratory tracts uh, and in their noses that they can't get rid of. And they end up with what we refer to as fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. So we now know a huge proportion of patients with chronic fatiguing illnesses, uh, water damage building or biotoxins from blue-green algae in lakes if they're going to swim in rivers and lakes, etc., or even tick-borne illnesses cause almost identical symptoms in these patients and and. Um, Fortunately, clinicians are starting to get more aware of it, thanks to my book and the enormous amount of medical conferences I speak at. And also because scientific literature is starting to really come up a lot with it, especially from Richie Shoemaker's work. So mould causes chemical, I believe, and I haven't read this anywhere, but from my understanding is mould causes chemical sensitivity because when the body's trying to clear it out of the body, it dumps the biotoxins in the bowel into the bile. Now, bile is recirculated. So if you don't have anything like good fibre in the diet or um, binders like cholestyramine, which is like an anti-cholesterol drug that they're using to help these patients, it gets reabsorbed back in the body. But by doing that, it affects the gut microbiome and it creates huge amounts of metabolites that have to go through the liver to be detoxed. So what we're finding is people who are in a water damaged building, and we're talking one in two two homes in Australia that, wow. that they inhale these biotoxins and then they try to clear it through the bowel. It creates all these metabolites which go through the liver and block the liver detoxification pathways so that the mm. chemicals in our food like gluten and preservatives and colours as well as chemicals in our home like flame retardants, pesticides and our perfume and our moisturisers can no longer use this sulfation pathway phase two glucuronidation and sulfation pathways um, which means that these chemicals stay in the body a lot longer their half-life is increased and this is why they become chemically sensitive at the same time catecholamines like neuroadrenaline and melatonin which we mentioned before and serotonin and um, noradrenaline they also use these detoxification pathways. So now the patient over time develops anxiety and depression and sleep disturbances and gluten intolerance and food mm. sensitivities because the foods, it, the biotoxins in the bowel affect the gut permeability, but it also affects detoxification. So these patients start getting chemically sensitive to their food and to the environment, which is not related to their diet. Wow, that's fascinating. It sounds a little bit overwhelming when you uh, talk about all these things. And um, in a way, food seems to be so simple compared to in controlling in, uh, such an environment because like, I know how to shop for healthy organic food and to cook it in a healthy way. But uh, I don't know if there's mold in my house. And if there is, I don't even know how to get rid of it. And like, do I have to knock the house down and build a new one? Or what? Like, <laughs> what's, uh, how, how do you go about uh, remedying something like mold in the house? Yeah, well, that's a good question. First thing is mould isn't the problem, it's moisture. Because microbes are everywhere, bacteria, yeast, fungi, etc. they're everywhere in the home and the planet because um, fungi are nature's greatest decomposers. So they should be there. The problem is the food, is the building materials are so poor nowadays. We have particle board and MDF and melamine and it's like Macca's, mm. McDonald's for mould. And we have <laughs> in our paint which is selecting for pathogenic fungi unfortunately so when you have moisture sitting on a surface for 48 hours or more the microbes on that surface are going to start producing toxins to kill one another off to take over that space so the key to mold is actually moisture if you have a flood 
If you have a pipe burst, you've got to dry it out within 48 hours. Otherwise, you're going to start having a microbial issue in a water-damaged environment. So mm -hmm. the problem is you move into a house and you don't know, and that's where a building biologist can be useful because they can do testing to see what the fungal ecology is for the place. They can do moisture mapping with their thermal cameras and moisture meters to determine the degree of moisture and the potential um, uh, effect that that could have on the microbial life. We can do air samples and surface samples, but of course that all comes at a cost. You know, each air sample we do is about $120 lab cost, and you'd need to do a minimum of four if you've got a water damaged building in the affected area, outside as a control, etc. So unfortunately most people won't get much change out of $1,500 to assess a house for water damage and mould if they're going to do lab testing. Okay, so that's only in the assessment sense, ask. right? So, like, oh. following that, there's there's so much more cost involved in actually fixing the problem. It's like, yeah, so yeah. It, look, some of the times they don't need to. It's a brought yeah. water damage. Um, it thinks a good exposure history is so important. That's why my healthy home survey is important because it's asking the right questions about mm. their health. We know with asthma allergies and chronic fatigue syndrome are important health symptoms that could be aggravated by biotoxins in a water damaged environment so that's the first thing we'll often look at we'll find we'll ask questions like since living in this home has your health changed when you're away from the home does it improve and they're key questions mm. that tell us almost instantly, wow, there's likely to be something in the house. Did the previous occupants get sick? What were, did they suffer from? And ask the neighbours about the previous occupants can be such valuable information in determining, okay, it sounds like there could be an issue here. That's really interesting. I'm wondering about um, our kitchen cabinets have, uh, they're the particle board melamine type of thing. And I know when we, we first um, got the kitchen um, we had some things done in the kitchen and the cabinet maker said, oh, the owner who built the house like 10 years ago, he said he shouldn't have used this stuff. He said up here in Far North Queensland, people don't use this because it's so moist here and it just holds the moisture. And he said, in a few years, you'll have to get rid of it all. And we're at that stage now because like if the kids overflow the sink when they're getting water out of the filter into their bottles, which they do quite often, um, it all goes under the sink and it goes into the cupboards and it swells up. And so there's all these ripples in the, in the um, front of the cabinet. And so what is the best material to build kitchen cabinets from to avoid the mould? Well, natural materials, like, you know, your timbers uh, yeah. that aren't sealed with plastic would be yes. the best because timber... And there's different types of timber, of course, like your hardwoods that are amazing high growth scopicity, i.e. their ability to absorb and release moisture and adapt to that little microenvironment is remarkable. So you would use mm. materials made, made from natural fibres like your, your timbers. Stone can also be useful in small amounts as well um, and other forms of masonry. But timber is one of your best because it's hygroscopic and it can absorb and release moisture depending on the humidity in the air. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So um, this is these are just two things out of so many, and I know that you um, we were talking before the show about things like food packaging and chemical intoxicants in food. So um, this might be super relevant as well to the people who listen to the show. So can you illuminate us on that topic? Sure. Um, I think with food packaging, the issue is not whether any chemicals will leach from the packaging at all, but how much. And that's the problem. When you go from healthy, fresh food to processed food, you are essentially doing two things. You're decreasing your nutrients and at the same time increasing your toxins. And, of course, this changes the whole balance of survival because nutrition is your backbone in biochemistry. So a good diet generally will provide resilience against environmental site, um, insults, whilst a poor diet that's high in processed food will result in low res resilience. So it's really important to reduce processed foods out of, the, out of the diet, and I'm sure you guys are right on to that. But in relation to packaging, it's making sure you're not exposing yourself to hormone-disrupting chemicals, which are very common with your PVC plastics and polycarbonate plastics and polystyrene, PVC, polystyrene and polycarbonate. 
Um, your BPAs, your BPA frees are all a problem. BPA free, they often use the same family of chemicals, BPS, BPF, which is showing to be worse in terms of estrogenic effects. So we'll get rid of the plastics for food packaging. Go with your stainless steel, your ceramics, your corning ware, and of course, glass. I will freeze food, leftovers, and things in glass that have plastic lids. Mm-hmm. where the lids don't contact the uh, food. Mm. Um, greaseproof paper, often in fast foods like pizza and chip boxes, etc., can contain um, polyfluoroalkyl phosphoric acids, which are not good, and they are suspected to be carcinogens. Um, mm. Like your microwave bags, the foods that are in microwavable bags are a real problems, and they've been linked. They can be found in about 40% of the packaging and are linked to thyroid-related problems and developmental issues in children. Obviously, the old ones were the lead crystal, the brass and the glazed pottery, which could be radioactive. So lead crystal, you know, people get a bit of glass of wine on a special night and lead crystal. That's not good because it's loaded with lead. But the big ones are your plastics. So you want to really reduce the amount of plastics in your food packaging as much as possible. Use your wax wraps instead, stainless steel containers. My kids drink from stainless steel water bottles. I drink from glass. Um, you, um, that you know, go back to the basics, the way it was pre-industrial revolution. You mentioned microwaves earlier. This is something that I haven't had in my house maybe for like ten years, and it's because it's such a, a relatively new form of cooking or and heating that I avoid it. I kind of go back to you know tradition. But um, you know, what are your views on that? That's a great question. My views on microwave. Well, firstly, microwaves can emit high magnetic fields whilst they are on and the digital display can emit it. So you don't want to stand within, you know, half a metre of, it, of your microwave oven for, you know, for long periods of time. Not that people do. In terms of the impact on food, we know it affects B6. But the real concern I have about microwave food is it kills the vitality of the food. Now, a recent study in Japan showed that when people eat nori, for example, seaweed, they that the bacteria naturally in the seaweed would transfer their genes into the person's gut microbiome and train their bacteria to digest the seaweed to release the nutrients, which help the bacteria release the nutrients that they used and that you use as a, as a human being. So that bacteria on fruit and vegetables are actually really important because they could be conferring their genes to train our gut microbes how to digest the food. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So the quickest way to kill that is to microwave it because a microwave oven sterilizes everything. It's great to sterilize your dishcloth, you know, to get rid of the bacteria, the E. coli or whatever you've got on your sponge, stick it in the microwave for five or ten seconds but never microwave food because it could be killing off the bacteria that's training your gut to digest it. So this is the devastating impact, I think, is why children are much more high risk for asthma and allergies if they are not breastfed, for whatever reason, I can understand. I mean, I could only um, breastfeed one of my twins. You know, I had to, they had half breast milk, half infant mm-hmm. formula because I never had enough milk for both. Um, and if you stare, put that milk, like we just boiled it, on the stove, like the old-fashioned way, out in glass bottles. We didn't put it in plastic and we certainly, God forbid, sterilised our infant formula or breast milk in a microwave oven because the bacteria in the breast milk is so important to confer to the Mm. child's immune system and reduce their asthma and allergy risk. Now, I've never read that anywhere. That's just my theory. I wrote Mm. it in the book. Uh, And it really, it really makes sense to me because it, 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 uh, we understand now why so many kids have got high rates of asthma and allergy, especially if they uh, don't have breast milk, if they're relying on infant formula and their diversity of their gut microbes is essentially disappeared because they're microwaving their food. How, how is that going to be more detrimental than, say, boiling? Like, wouldn't the bacteria also die? I know. I, only bacteria that don't survive at 100 degrees Celsius will die off. So, oh, no. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So you're boiling, you're not, and you're not boiling the milk. You're sterilizing. Look, you can. I ster, I use my microwave oven to sterilize my glass baby bottles, but I didn't boil the milk, so yes. to speak, when I put That's in. It. I just warmed it up, so it was never boiling it to 100 degrees. Mm. That's that's yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Great. So um, 
Wow, really like there's a whole gamut of stuff to look at as well. So we've looked at mold and we've looked at EMF and packaging at, at home. What else do you guys look at when you come to a house? We look at um, things like, well, chemical load. You know, most of the inf- most of the exposures to chemicals are going to be in the household dust. So if there's visible dust or visible clutter, the colour of the dust we look at. So, for example, if people live very close to there's a bus stop outside of their home, then you often find the colour of the dust along the window sills of that side of the home can be black and that can often be wear and tear of um, tyres as well as diesel particles which are known carcinogens, etc. So we'd say, okay, don't open the windows in this side of the home, get an air filter in this part of the house because if you don't get a filter, your body will be the filter and it has to deal with those carcinogens and those particulates. So we look at dust a big part of the work we do is getting the vacuum cleaner out. I love vacuum cleaners. After Mm -hmm. I interview the clients, I get their vacuum cleaner, I pull it apart and I go, okay, uh, here's the HEPA filter. It hasn't been replaced. Most time people go, I don't even know where that was or what it is. (laughs) Um, It's the most important part of the vacuum cleaner if it has one, a high-efficiency particulate air filter because it will filter all your allergens and um, many of your biotoxins um, down to about point, you know, below 0.3 microns. So I show them where they have a filter is if they have one in the unit that it has to be replaced, you know, at least every six to 12 months. I show them how to vacuum properly. Most people have no idea that they need to vacuum one square metre for at least a minute or two, and that's far more effective than doing a weekly clean for six weeks um, to reduce the allergen load. I show them how to um, damp with microfiber cloths and damp microfiber cloths to reduce the dust load and how to dust. Simple things like that are one of the most important things we do as building biologists and showing them why they need to take their shoes off before they come into the home so they don't track the tons of pesticides that the council spray into the household dust. Hmm. You said um, up a minute per square metre. How much? How long? Sorry. Yeah, you're looking one to two minutes per square metre of carpet or rug. Now, because it takes so long, you'd be best to do one room like that thoroughly every week and every week do a different room and spend a lot of time with a motorised head on the vacuum cleaner. So it's actually digging into the pile and it has to have a HEPA filter. So I have a list of the best vacuum cleaners I recommend on my website, buildingbiology.com.au, and the the different brands and models that I recommend. That is the the vacuum cleaner and the water water filter are the two only things I recommend you buy, apart from microfiber cloths, in my entire book. The rest is knowledge. That's good. So what was the the vacuum cleaner and the what, sorry? Water Water filter. filter. Water filter. Okay. Um, So you were talking about also air filters. Um, Do you, so you you don't recommend anything around air filters? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. So I use a lot of Oz Climates air filters. Um, but yeah, air filters, depending on what you're trying to reduce, what is the pollutant you're trying to get rid of. So, you know, you've got um, um, HEPA filters, you've got carbon filters that deal with the chemicals or gases in the air. The HEPA filter reduces the particulates in the air, like your allergens, etc. So we use, I find with my daughter who gets allergies, that if I run the hair filter in her room overnight, she doesn't get any coughing or anything like that in her hair filter. Oh, that's interesting. Well, and yeah. and what, what's the air filter that you use? I use Oz Climate. So, Oz Climate. But there are many, many on the market. Yes, I use Oz Climate. I okay. find they're really good and they're very reasonably priced, you know, four or $500. I think the, the better unit is 600 or 700 I mean, as I said, if you don't get a filter, your body will be the filter. And many of these air pollutants are very strongly correlated with your heart disease risk, heart attack, respiratory problems and allergies. I'm trying to will one that. air filter uh, oh, cover a fair bit of... Sorry, will one air filter cover a few rooms or is that per no, room? No, it depends on the size of the filter. It'll tell you what how many square metres it will capture, right. what the capture zone will be. Okay. Um, all right, I went to your website and I looked up vacuum cleaners in the search. So that, that's the page. Okay, so we've got, all right, so there's a really good list of stuff from Bosch to Mealy and Dyson, which is, which is great. People get a, a lot of options around that because I've been looking at replacing mine. I think I have a Dyson, but um, I'm not sure. If, like, it, it's quite old now, so I'm not sure if it has a, a HEPA filter or a motorized head. I don't think it does. Um, oh. 
that's yeah. really important. So that's, yeah, okay, that's that's really good. I don't have much carpet around the house, so it's mostly like uh, wooden floorboards. Well, that's even better. Yeah, yeah, okay, wonderful. That's that's all great to know. That's such handy information. Um, so uh, looking at air quality then, uh, obviously depending on where you live, the air quality is going to be... Um, very different like if you're in the city or if you're in the country um so the function for the air, air filter is to remove um what like dust and um airborne like what, what does it take, get it at, get it sorry what does an air filter right. get out of it so the HEPA filter will get rid of particulates so mm-hmm. anything that's particle like your allergens your dust mite dust mite poo so to speak where all the allergens are cockroach and pet dander um pollens which are quite large, easy to remove. So your allergens basically are what it will re- remove and, of course, dust. And what's on the dust is often chemicals. I mean, your flame retardants, your pesticides, your solvents, your glues, your cleaning product solvents, yeah. all these things. Dry ah, I'm panicking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why. And if the thing is, if you get a good vacuum cleaner fitted with a HEPA filter and a motorised head, it will be the air filter for your home. That's the irony. So a good vacuum cleaner will actually filter the air in your home. Right. So you don't have to have the air filter running all the time then. It's something. That- well, I do. I mean, because uh, it's only when you vacuum that you're going to get the benefits, whereas an air filter that's run, you know, during pollen season for patients with asthma, with, uh, hay fever, then, you know, you need to run it then because it's 24-7 or whilst they're sleeping in their bedroom running it low, you know. So the air filter, the vacuum cleaner, if you don't have a HEPA filter on your vacuum cleaner, you're going to considerably pollute the air in your home because you're going to get it out of the rug and the the carpet and you're going to make it corn. Flying around everywhere. I was considering buying those new handheld uh, Dysons, you know, the the ones without a, like, I think they're battery operated rather than... uh, plugged into the wall just to make it easy. Do you know anything about those, whether they're good or not good? Well, the sucking force is really compromisable. It'll probably give you a back problem trying to lean over using it. And it won't have to be like... Yeah, if the sucking force is efficient, you're not going to suck much up. So it's all right for surfaces and non-carpeted areas. That would be fine. Um, but for carpeted surfaces where all the allergens and the chemicals are, you want a HEPA filter and a motorised head to dig into the pile. Mm. If you have mainly non-carpeted areas like tiles and floorboards, then you know a microfiber cloth mop is really your best option. Oh, wow. Okay. Um I'm really interested in the bedroom uh, in terms of dust mites and um, you know, keeping the bed really healthy. What are your tips on that? Sorry, could you? I just you just cut out. What was that? No, that's all right. Okay, so I was. Uh, I'm really interested in keeping the bedroom healthy in terms of dust mites on the bed and just making sure that the environment where I sleep in is is healthy with. with to allergens, can you give us some tips on like the the bedroom and the bed, especially? Yes, so with dust mites, it's so important that you reduce the load by airing the mattresses and the pillows in the sun as often as you can. Whenever you clean your bed sheets, air your mattress if you can. At least your pillows need to be aired and they need to be replaced every 18 months, every 12 months to 18 months, especially if you have allergens. Um, mattresses mm. shouldn't be more than 10 years old and if they've been exposed to anyone who's been on chemotherapeutic drugs or urine, that's not ideal because it, the dust mites will explode as a result of that. Wow. Um, dust mite covers are very useful because, and it's about the thread size. So if you've got six microns or less as a thread size, as in the pores of the um, bed covers, that will re- stop dust mite from coming up from the mattress. So that's good. It's also good to have um, um, silk is probably one of the best materials if you've got allergies and it's naturally dust mite proof. So silk pillows, silk bedding is actually really good. Do you have any recommendation on uh, mattresses that uh, don't create a dust mite issue? Or Yes. Um, well, late, natural latex, not tallalate, but natural latex is naturally dust mite resistant. But yeah. look, it all comes down to the moisture and the sweat you have okay. every night. You're putting a lot in there. And, of course, remember with microbes, it's all about moisture. So that's why air in your mattresses actually are really important. That's why futons can be great providing you are airing them regularly. 
Mm. And of course, having having the mattress on a slatted bed, not on solid timber. Like a lot of the mm. kids' beds have cupboards underneath them. That's not good at all because the mattress can't breathe from underneath and that will increase the allergens that children are likely to be exposed to. Okay. Um, one of the ladies who work with you, we, saw, we met you at the Mind Forum just uh, on the weekend and um, she was telling me about like not doing the bed straight away after you wake up to allow the moisture to get, get out. I thought that was a really good tip as well. So it doesn't allow dust mites to sort of proliferate if you've got, um, if you hide them under the bed sheet straight away. So that, that was pretty cool. Oh, okay, so uh, yeah. generally what we recommend is you open up your bed sheets and don't make your bed. Yes. So that you yeah, that's what she was saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. important. Yeah. And in fact, when you, on the day you vacuum, it's really important as soon as you get out of bed to vacuum the mattresses while the dust mite is still on the surface before they migrate to the middle of the mattress. Okay. I'll vacuum the, the mattress, all right. Yeah, I have a friend who used to vacuum it every day. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> Amazing. Right. Okay, great. Um, well, this is such a, a, a mysterious topic for us, so it's kind of hard for us even to know what questions to ask you. Are there any? Oh, I've got more. Yeah? Right. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, um, so my daughter's room is at the side of the house where the rain hits usually, and she loves her window open, so she does close it when she goes out but her room gets a little bit damp. Is it good to have a dehumidifier in there? Yeah, window open. If you're in far north Queensland, not ideal because the more it's so humid outside, you're bringing it all in. Yeah. So yes, a dehumidifier is important. And a dehumidifier that naturally kicks in when the humidity starts going beyond 60% is important because the ideal humidity inside the house should be between 40 and 60%. Okay. So um, you're so your air conditioner would actually be a natural dehumidifier. So I don't have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we live up in the mountains, so it's a lot cooler up here and the humidity is oh. not as bad as the coast. But um, in the wet season, it's shocking. And we've noticed a few patches in the ceiling where the mould's coming through. Um, I'm not really sure how you, like, obviously there must be some leaks up in the roof that we need to address because that's not good. <laughs> so, um, Yeah. There's um, just a little bit of, yeah, sometimes you get a bit of a smell in the room and so we go over the whole thing with the clove oil and everything and do lots of vacuuming. And um, yeah. But, yeah, I think the dehumidifier might be a good idea. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Dehumidifier, yeah. especially where you live, would be a great idea. Okay. Mm. Um, I did have another question about, oh, and so what did you say about windows open? If it's, if it's not raining, um, it's okay to leave all the windows open. You're just saying if it's rainy. So yeah, saying? no, it's it's all about the humidity. So get a you know you can get a um, a hygrometer from an electronic store or even online for about twenty dollars. It tells you about relative humidity. That's what you can get for your okay. house to make sure that the humidity doesn't exceed sixty percent. Otherwise, all your allergens will proliferate, and of course, the mold will start uh, proliferating as well. Okay, so do you have a recommendation for humidifi dehumidifiers or just have a look? Yeah, look, I use, again, I use Oz Climate. Um, okay. But look, the dehumidifiers are pretty simple in their technology. So it's just a matter of how big the dehumidifier is, make sure it's appropriate for the room size. Yeah. Um, and you were saying that if you come home... Or if you leave the house and your hay fever clears up, that that's a sign that there it could be a mold issue. Could um, be mold, or, yes, pollen or I, dust mite. Yep. Okay, I do actually notice that with myself. I came home from our trip away. We were in New South Wales for a week, and um, the day I arrived home that evening, within an hour or two, I started sneezing violently and then um it's my nose is still running now but it's starting to calm down but it's been a day and a half and I wasn't sure if it was my husband had a candle burning that was had no scent but it wasn't the natural one and I said get that off I think it could be that but it, I don't know maybe it could be the mold it's so hard to pinpoint these things yeah so I mean if it is that then you can experiment have it on and off and then see how you go but I mean mm. you're a, you're in a high humidity climate, so that's a problem. Any yeah. form of vegetable mould, odour or condensation in the house is a big marker for problems. Yeah. Yeah, it usually doesn't have odour. 
I'm very sensitive to any kind of sense as well. Do you want to just mention about candles and things? As I think you were, you mentioned that um, the toxins in products, including candles, I think a lot of people don't understand about the problem that can be. Yeah. Okay. So my top three chemicals that are a problem are perfume and fragrances and air fresheners are incredibly toxic. Because of mm. trade secrecy laws, manufacturers are not required to A, test them to see if they're safe. And secondly, um, there are hundreds of petrochemicals. Many of them are known to be irritants to the human health mm. and can contain hormone disrupting chemicals. So anything that's with a fragrance, um, especially that's artificially derived, that's not an essential oil, should be avoided in a house. And perfume is one of the most toxic things you could possibly put near your person. After shave, mm. anything with a strong smell is toxic. One in three Australians in a recent study was shown to get headaches and um, sensitive to artificial fragrances, and they should be banned in workplaces because I think they're like tobacco smoke. They're a, a real irritant and they're incredibly toxic. But women don't realise when they see um, the propaganda in the media about buying these ridiculous products yeah. that models attached to them, that they're toxic products that can cause devastating impacts in utero to their unborn child that could set up their ability to be fertile and breast cancer risk later on in life. So, you know, these things are, are just wrong, but people need to understand, which is the p first part of my book, you know, which was titled in Chapter 1, The True Cost of Progress, why these exposure standards are not health-based standards and compromised with industry and manufacturers who don't have the duty of care or are not required to prove that their chemicals are safe before they're released into the marketplace. So just assume most of the personal care products, cleaning products you buy, have never been tested for their impact on human health. And many yeah. of them are showing to have devastating impacts on health. Mm. And that's why my husband and I end up selling our house to create our own cleaning product brand because everything, when I was training people in, in building biology, I couldn't give them a solution to cleaning products because we need dishwashing liquids, we need laundry products to mm. clean our clothes and um, that's why we uh, established the Abode cleaning product range through the health food stores. Oh, okay, Abode, is that one yours? Yeah. Cool. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, that's that's the something that I've had to really be careful with for years. If I, if I even walk past someone with a strong perfume, I start sneezing. <laughs> so it's terrible, terrible stuff. Um, looking at, at your website, you have uh, a section that talks about hazards in the home. So we've covered a lot of this uh, stuff already, but um, we haven't spoken about things like um, lead dust and toxic gases. So can you talk a little bit about those two, please? Sure. So lead dust is still a huge problem. Around one in three homes built before 1970 will have lead content in their paint of up to 50% in the lead paint on their walls. So that's not a problem providing you don't renovate. If you renovate and release that lead dust as a, um, that lead paint as a dust by sanding it back, that can expose you to very toxic high levels of lead and we know there are no safe levels for lead and it's strongly correlated with infertility in males but also um, anemia and also learning and behavioural disorders and a significant drop in IQ in children. Hmm. That's, that's a real problem. We also have lead in uh, copper pipe, lead solder in um, galvanised pipe and copper pipe so that's a good Another reason why we recommend a water filter. And the other one is toxic gases. You know, having unfluid gas heaters is a real problem because it can kill you with the carbon monoxide exposure. You also have toxic gases from vehicle exhaust um, and uh, the combustion of fossil fuels and wood combustion fireplaces and stoves. So, you know, unfluid gas appliances should be removed out of the house and don't idle your car um, in the garage if you have a door connected into your house. Mm. So um, if the heater isn't uh, fluid, like even opening the window does, isn't good enough? Like to let the air... Well, well, we yes, yeah, so if you have an unfluid gas appliance, you must open your windows, that's yeah. a requirement. But why risk killing your family from carbon monoxide poisoning? If you're going to have an unfluid gas heater, yes, you need to open windows and you need a carbon monoxide monitor that goes off to tell you, hey, the levels are high, it's going to kill you, mm. would be a good yeah. Okay. compulsory in the United Kingdom, not in Australia. Look, unfluid gas appliances are not sold that I'm aware of anymore, although you could get them secondhand on eBay and, and other stores. But really, they should be avoided because there's very strong correlations with asthma 
and um, exposure to ni noxious gases like nitrogen dioxide from appliances. We just have like a, a gas heater that's attached to a gas bottle, so you're saying that's not a good idea? Not inside the house. Yeah, so that, you know, because any form of gas, it does have a smell there that they add so that you can smell the gas to say, hey, there's a problem. But look, gas appliance is not ideal. Electric mm -hmm. radiators or hydronic heating is always far better, and I discussed that at length in my book, Healthy Home, Healthy Home. Okay. Yeah. Wow, okay. Okay. So much. Great. Right. Great. Mm. Uh, do you have any more questions? Or, no, or? that's that's good. I've, that's lots to think about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have to read the book. We'll do another session maybe when uh, listeners have questions with uh, for Nicole and have you back on the show. This has been uh, I incredibly broad and enlightening in terms of what, what's possible. I'd love to know a little bit more about your college, your training program. If people are interested in learning this for themselves. Also, how do they get a building biologist to come to their house? Sure. So the Australian College of Environmental Studies, I'm the CEO and founder of the college. The website is aces.edu.au. We have short courses in children's environmental health and mould testing and electromagnetic field testing right up to the nationally accredited advanced diploma of building biology and the certificate for in feng shui. I love the esoteric and the hard science. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So there's lots of information I'm about. I also have a newsletter, the Healthy Home Newsletter. So when you go to my website, buildingbiology.com.au, there's a newsletter that's free. You can sign up to We can keep you up to date on things like um, health hazards in the home and the latest research. Also, healthyhomesurvey.com. We'll be launching that, and that'll be a free way of assessing the health of your home, um, and that'll be launched in July with my um, in conjunction with my professor, Mark Cohen. And what else did you ask? A building biologist. You can find them on the Australasian Society of Building Biologists website. That's asbb.org.au. Um, it's .org or .org.au, ASBB. Um, great bunch of practitioners out there throughout Australia who can assist in doing audits of your home. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. I uh, really appreciate yeah, you being on been... the show, and it's been fantastic. Yeah, big eye-opener. Thank you so much. No problem at all. Thank you. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.